Um, okay, thank you and thank you for inviting me. Um, I'm going to talk about perhaps something a bit different, um, which is behavioural measurements in humans, um, looking at generally what is now called social neuroscience. So how we encode information about other people that we meet. Um, and specifically, I'm going to be talking about the work that we've been doing for the last few years on gaze processing. So how we, we understand where other people are looking, how long they're looking, um, and the repercussions that may have. And so um, gaze is actually quite an important thing for us to be able to encode. Um, it's been shown to play a large role in social interactions and so there are all sorts of theories about um, the development of understanding of others, so theory of mind, um, and so it helps us understand what other people are interested in, being able to understand what they're looking at, how long they're looking at it. Um, it's generally affected in a range of clinical conditions, so for example schizophrenia is characterized by abnormal gaze, um, as is autism, people don't like to make eye contact, um, and gaze is quite an innate behavior, so from birth newborn babies already look more at faces that are looking directly at them than at faces where their gaze is averted. So already at a very very young age um, children, babies, recognize direct gaze. And interestingly, even children that are born from blind parents and so um, who, who don't have that perhaps gaze interaction that you have with normally sighted parents, um, they actually have absolutely normal gaze behavior. So it's not as if it's a learnt behavior, it's something that seems to be innate. So I'm going to talk about both the spatial properties of gaze and the temporal properties of gaze. Um, and I'm not going to spend a huge amount of time on the spatial properties, um, partly because that's a bit of older research that I've been doing. Um, and I'm going to discuss more the work that we've been doing lately, understanding how we make judgments about how long gaze lasts. So I'm, I'm going to briefly discuss these three different types of experiments that we've done to look at some of the properties of gaze and then I'm going to talk about temporal processing of gaze. So um, the most basic experiments to look at how good we are at um, encoding another person's gaze are called these categorization type of experiments. Um, we put people in front of a computer and we show them a face. So usually there aren't six like this, you just show one computer generated face, it can be a real face, um, and you vary the gaze in the eyes and you simply ask people to say whether it looks like it's direct, as is that case, or if it looks averted to the left or to the right, and you change the amount of deviation you put and you simply get people to respond to tell what gaze they think that face is showing. When you do that, you get data that look a bit like this. So this is just the gaze deviation on the x-axis from very much to the left, zero is uh, perfectly direct, and this is very much to the right. And this is data from one person. The red is the proportion of times the person said the gaze was deviated to the right. And so when it's, all, when it's very much right words, they always say right. When it comes closer to direct, they sort of say right and direct. And then when it's left words, they never say right. The blue shows the same, but for their left words responses. And the purple is when they say it looks direct. And so you can fit functions to these data. And when you do, you can see that there's these uh, two intersection points between what people call direct and what they call either rightwards or leftwards. And the distance here is referred to as the cone of direct gaze. So that simply refers to the range of gaze deviations 
that people judge to be directed at them. And the only thing I'll say about this is actually, this is quite a broad, actually, range of gaze deviations. So we are generally quite liberal in our judgments of whether someone is looking at us or not. Um, and this cone of direct gaze is used as a way to measure properties about different types of populations. Um, and so you can change the emotion, for example, on the face, and it's been shown that if you use angry faces, that increases the width of this cone of direct gaze. So somehow, when we're looking at an angry face, we'll tend to assume that they're looking at us. Um, and this has been shown to be particularly correlated with social anxiety. So people who are more socially anxious will tend to think that, that someone with an angry face is looking at them over a wider range of gaze deviations. It's also been shown in schizophrenia. You get this increase in the range of gaze deviations that a schizophrenic thinks are, deviated, uh, are pointing at them compared to normals. And interestingly, it's also correlated with age. So we've tested a number of children. You can ignore this. These are year one, year three, and year five, so about six years old, eight, and ten. And um, this cone width decreases with age. So very young children tend to think that um, people are looking at them more than older children would. Um, so that's one of the things that this very basic measure is used for, to try and distinguish different types of populations of people. Um, We've been doing some work with adaptation, and I'm not going to spend a huge amount of time on this, but one of the things that has been done was to try to understand how gaze is being actually processed in the brain. So it's been shown already 30 or 40 years ago that there are neurons in the brain that respond actually to the direction of gaze of a monkey. So this was done um, by Dave Parrott, and they recorded from cells in uh, the parietal cortex, and they found that these cells respond to specific directions of gaze. So that seems to suggest that there are neurons in the brain that actually encode gaze. Um, and so we've looked at this using adaptation um, rather than putting electrodes into people's brains. And so what you can do using adaptation is to simply see if by adapting to a particular type of stimulus, you can change the perception of a subsequent stimulus. And so um, we did this, um, and we'll do a brief demo. It's not as strong as the color adaptation, but um, this has been used to try and understand whether gaze, when it's encoded in the brain, whether we have neurons that respond to leftwards and rightwards, and it's the relative activity of these two that give you information about direct, or whether you've got three different types of groups of neurons, some that respond to direct, some that respond to left, and some that respond to right. Um, and so what you can do is adapt people to, for example, leftwards directions of gaze, and then show them a direct gaze and see if that shifts their perception or not. And then you can adapt them to right words and see if it shifts in the opposite direction. And you can adapt to direct gaze and see how that alters your perception. And by looking at the relative shifts after adaptation, that will inform you as to whether you've got just two different populations of neurons, left and right, or whether you've got three, left, direct, and right. So. Um, this is an example. Um, so you can look sort of anywhere on the face. And um, these are all faces looking to the right. And you're going to see two faces at the end of this procedure. And you hopefully one of them will look more averted than the other.
Did one of them look of those two men more averted than the other? Yeah? But they're actually perfectly identical. They're just flipped versions of each other. So you all adapted to a right words gaze deviation and that caused perceptual shifts in um, your perception of left of right words gaze. So this is just the data that shows what you've just experienced. So the red is the the number of direct responses that people give before any kind of adaptation. The blue here shows after you've adapted to something that's very much looking to the left, what happens is that something slightly looking to the left now appears to be direct. And that's basically what you all experienced. And you can do the same with the right words. So if something, if you adapt to someone looking very much to the right and then you see a slightly rightwards gaze that looks direct. And so using that, um, we also interleaved. So instead of always adapting to leftwards, you adapt to left, right, left, right, left, right. That causes an overall increase in this cone of direct gaze. Um, and this has been modeled as the result of adaptation to three different gaze channels. So we and others have shown that actually you have groups of neurons, channels, uh, that encode leftwards gaze, direct gaze, and rightwards gaze. And the final uh, bit that I will talk about, about the spatial properties of gaze, um, is work that we've done to look for whether we have a prior assumption that actually gaze is directed towards us. So in vision, there's a growing interest in applying a Bayesian framework to understanding how we see things in the world. And so the idea is that our prior experience will lead to certain expectations about how things look. And this will influence the way we see things. And so one um, well-known one is that there's, for example, a prior to assume that light comes from above because light always comes from above. And so if you look at ambiguous stimuli that could be interpreted in one of two ways, either as being lit from above or as being lit from below, 90 5% of people always see that as being lit from above. So there is quite a bit of evidence that we have some of these priors that influence the way we see things. And we wanted to see whether we have a prior for direct gaze, given that its gaze is such a fundamental property and direct gaze particularly appears to be something quite fundamentally innate. Um, and so this is just an example where if you increase the uncertainty in the signal, so in this case if someone's wearing glasses so you can't actually see which direction their eyes are pointing, would you tend to think that that's directed at you? So um, within a, a Bayesian framework, the basic idea is that if you have a stimulus which is simply represented by this kind of a likelihood function, and you have a prior, then your perception of that stimulus gets drawn towards the prior. And the idea is that if you add uncertainty to the stimulus, so you widen this likelihood function, you'll have a greater influence of the prior, and so you should get a greater shift in your perception. Um, and so we and others have used this to look for evidence of a prior. And so what you can do is add noise to the stimulus and see if that alters your perception of that stimulus. So what we did um, is we would show people a single face that would disappear and then a pointer would appear on the monitor um, and they would use this pointer to indicate the direction of gaze of the face. Uh, and the direction of gaze could vary along all these different axes. We did that without noise, as shown here, and then we did this in a noise condition where literally we just added pixelated noise onto the eyes, and so it was harder to see. 
So this is what the data, the raw data would look like. This is when the gaze could go along this axis here. Um, and there were nine different gaze deviations. So nine is the furthest out to this direction, then six, three, zero, and then nine downwards. Um, and this shows you each one of the pointer responses uh, in these different conditions. And the gray is simply the average of those responses. And this is, in no uh, this is when there was no noise on the stimulus. And this is when there was noise on the stimulus. And so what we wanted to see is, is there a difference between the position of these gray points between the no noise and the noise conditions? And so this is what we found. So these data are for eight different participants. And uh, these are just the two XY deviations for the eyes. And the solid dot is the response, the average pointer response when there was no noise. And then the line exceed, extending from that ends at what would be the average pointer response when there was noise. So hopefully you can all see that th there seem to be these lines pointing inwards towards the center. And so if you look at the average, you can see it perhaps more clearly. Um, and we fit an affine function to this and basically found that when you add uncertainty like this, there is a shift in your perception of the gaze slightly central, so slightly towards direct gaze. Right, so more recently, what we've been doing is looking at the temporal properties of gaze. So it's all well to be able to very accurately determine exactly where someone is looking, but people never hold their gaze in one position for more than a couple of seconds, and gaze is a highly dynamic process. So. Um, what we did was to measure how sensitive we are to how long people look at you. And so um, what I'm going to talk about now are the result of an experiment that we conducted over five weeks at the Science Museum. And so um, we had two eye trackers in the Science Museum um, and we had people come in, we tested over about 500 people who were just in the Science Museum, um, and we showed them stimuli, and I'll show you examples of this, um, and so we got them to do a behavioral task, so they simply had to say whether they thought the person looking on the, at them on this monitor, so it was like a Skype scenario, they would see a face that would appear and then that person would look at them and then look away and they would simply have to say whether that felt too long or too short. Um, and we also recorded their eye movements while they were doing this task. So this is simply a, a description of what they would see. So that's the person's head, there's an eye tracker. One trial, there would be about 40 trials. One trial would consist of a face that would appear, that face would be looking down, then they would look up, make eye contact, and then look back down again. And the amount of time that they looked, that they made this eye contact varied from uh, very short, I think 100 milliseconds, to over 10 seconds. And so in different trials, they would see different lengths of time. Um, and they would simply have to say, using a key press, whether the amount of time that person looked at them felt too long or too short. And so to try and give the people a sense of, um, you know, how to do this, we said, if you were in the tube, and this was someone who was looking at you in the tube, would it feel sort of too long or too short with respect to your own sense of a normal amount of eye contact? Um, and so this was the this was the video I had wanted to show. Oh, oh, oh! It's working. So.
so this was, so I should say there were diff there were eight different actors that we used, and they were actually just graduate students, not real actors. Um, and so any one participant would randomly see only one of those eight people. So if this was the girl that I saw, every time I had to judge how long she was looking at me, she was the only person I would see. And so this is just an example of the different amounts of time. So this is what it would look like. Obviously when you were doing the experiment there was no information about the time. Um, and so the idea is that when it's very short, that's easy to say it's too short. When it's very long, that's also easy to say it's very long. And somewhere in between, you don't quite know. You'll say sometimes short, sometimes long. And um, we can take that as what would be your comfortable amount of eye contact. So there were eight different faces. Each person saw 35 clips of different durations. Um, sorry, each person saw 40 clips of different durations. We tested 498 people um, and we got eye tracking data on 463. In addition to that, we also asked the people to do basic face ratings. So their theory, well, their it's been suggested that f certain um, face traits, like dominance, um, might influence how comfortable you are with the amount of eye contact you make with someone. Um, and we also measured personality traits in the actual participant. So after they did the experiment, it was a very short questionnaire online, and we got um, these five measures of personality. So first, the behavioral data. So this is um, just showing for one person. So here, these are the different durations of eye contact that they were shown. And this is the amount of times they said it felt too long. And so here, they would never say it's too long. When it was very long, they would always say it's too long. You can fit a psychometric function to this data. And the 50% point is what we took to be the comfortable amount of eye contact. It was neither too long nor too short. And um, when we do that, this is the data for the 400 and however many people we had. Um, this is the distribution of preferred amounts of eye contact. You can fit a Gaussian to the data and we find on average people like about 3.3 seconds of eye contact. So the average preferred gaze duration is roughly 3.3 seconds. Surprisingly, the only actor variable that was correlated with this preferred amount of eye contact was threat. Um, attractiveness wasn't, dominance wasn't. Um, and surprisingly, there was absolutely no correlation between personality scores and preferred amount of eye contact. So we at least intuitively would have thought that people who, um, who report themselves as being introverted would like less eye contact, whereas people who report themselves to be extroverted might prefer more eye contact. But we found no correlation. There are a number of caveats. The first is that um, none of the actor ratings w scored particularly high or low on any of these traits. So perhaps if we had used you know, a supermodel who everyone would have rated as very attractive, we might have found an influence of attractiveness. Um, so that's one caveat. The other is obviously the personality s score. I mean, that's a very coarse measure, so um, it's not clear that that perhaps is fine enough. Um, and finally, this is obviously you in front of someone on a computer. It's not you in front of another person. And so it's quite likely that when it's a live situation, that might change a bit. Um, 
so we also looked, um, because we had the eye tracking data, we could also record changes in pupil size. And so um, the top uh, row up here, um, simply if you look at that distribution, uh, well, the equivalent of that, <laughs> um, we simply, what we did is we, um, we split it in half, in two, and so everyone to the right of the midpoint, we called those people short preferred gaze uh, people, and everyone to the left of that, we called them long preferred gaze, because this is simply the distribution of the preferred gaze durations. And um, the two traces that you can't really see, but you can as we go across here, the, the red one is the increase in pupil size as a function of the amount of time you make eye contact. Um, and the red and the blue are for the, the people who are in the short and long preferred amount categories. So the main thing, hopefully, to take from this is that if you simply separate your population in two, we find there's no difference in the increase in pupil size. However, if you start to look increasingly at um, the further and further tails of this distribution, so people who are actually further and further away in terms of their preferred amount of eye contact, we start to get a separation in the pupil change curves. And what we found, we did a PCA analysis on the rate of pupil change, and what we found is that apart from this condition here where we took uh, half and half, um, in all other comparisons where we were looking at further and further from the midpoint, we had a significant difference in the rate of increase in pupil size. So it seems to be that people who prefer longer amounts of eye contact also have a faster rate of pupil increase. Um, and changes in pupil size are linked to arousal, so it would seem to be that um, there is a correlation between arousal, changes in your pupil size, and how much eye contact you like to make with someone, you feel comfortable making with someone. Um, and the final bit I'm going to talk about is, um, so that's simply um, changes in pupil size, but obviously we can actually look at the scan paths that people made when they looked at the face. Um, and so we can quantify people's scan paths as they look at the faces. Um, and we can look at things like fixation duration, so how long you look at a particular part of the face before making a saccade to somewhere else. Um, and so to do this, these are just three of the eight actors that we had. To do this, what, what we did is we defined regions of interest on the face. Um, so the left eye, the right eye, the nose, the mouth, and the background was everything else. And um, what you can do is look at the amount of time people spend looking at these different regions of interest. And um, what we find, and <laughs> most of you, I assume, have never sort of done any kind of behavioral experiments, but this is perhaps th the biggest effect I've ever seen, um, especially at least for vision experiments. So what this is plotting is uh, the proportion of fixations in these different regions of interest averaged across all of the people. Uh, and the main thing is, there's what we found and something that apparently actually exists, which is known as the left eye bias, which is that everyone looks at the left eye. So this, the blue simply shows the proportion of fixations on the left eye. The right eye you can see is all the way down here. People do not look at the right eye 
this is as a function of time. So this is at least initially, this is a very, very big difference. Uh, it goes down a bit over time, but overall you still have this, this greater preference for the left eye. We had a fixation point, so there would be a fixation point before the face appeared, which was always in the center of the screen, so it wasn't over the left eye. So that's not what was happening, it's just people look to the left eye. Um, and it's not specific to any of the actors, so this is showing for the, the eight actors that we had. In some cases, actor four, you had this separation that's maintained throughout the entire trial. In some cases, like here or here, it disappears, but what you can see is that across all of them, this is how it starts off. You've got this very strong left eye bias. Um, surprisingly, because we weren't actually in any way interested or trying to find gender differences, um, what we found is that actually there were very strong gender differences in how people looked at the faces. Um, and so we have four categories. So we have a male participant looking at a male actor, a male participant looking at a female actor, female looking at a male, and then female, female. Um, and the main thing here is the brown curves are basically men, the red curves are women. Um, and so there's a very clear difference in the way men and women scan these faces. So generally, um, the fixation durations last much longer in men, so men just kind of look and then don't really go look anywhere else. Women are much more exploratory, so the fixation durations are shorter. Um, the saccade amplitudes, which are plotted here, are generally larger in women, so a saccade is in between two fixations, so they sort of really move around a lot more. Um, and so Antoine Coutreau, who's the postdoc who was working on this, he um, developed a classifier to, dis to test whether he could use this to distinguish, just based on the eye tracking data, whether it was coming from a man or a woman. Um, and with this classifier, he was able to accurately um, detect, determine whether it was a man or a woman with about 75% accuracy, which again is quite surprising given that there's no reason and no generally known um, gender differences in terms of how people look at faces. So uh, overall there's a very very strong left eye bias which is unclear why this is the case. Um, the, the closest explanation we could come with is that um, you may not know but everyone is eye dominant kind of like right arm, uh, right hand or left hand you have also an eye dominance um, and most people are right eye dominant and so what we hypothesized is that this left eye bias, it's a bit confusing, it's called the left eye because it's on the left side of the face, but in terms of the person, it's their right eye. And so the hypothesis is that actually, perhaps, because when you look at things, your eyes make small vergence cues, perhaps your right eye is a more reliable vergent cue than the left, simply because that's on average the dominant eye. And so maybe we have this sort of, sub well, not subconscious, although we don't know it, perhaps we've picked up from talking with lots and lots of people that actually looking at the person's right eye is the, the more reliable source of information. Uh, there are fundamental differences in the scanning behavior between men and women. And it's possible, sorry, it was 72% accuracy. Um, it's possible to build a classifier uh, using the scan path data to distinguish between men and women. Um, and yeah, so we're trying to continue this um, work 
um, we're doing some of this in social settings, so using continuing the work with the faces, but um, in terms of actually analyzing scan paths as a function of gender, um, we are trying to look at this using just sort of more naturalistic images to see if there are just differences in how people explore visual scenes. Um, and that's it. The first bit of the work was when I was mainly in Australia and all of the dynamic stuff is with a number of people mainly based at UCL. Thank you. <laughs>